All right, everyone, welcome to part two of 9-3, talking about now uh, the nuclei that control the functionality of the autonomic nervous system. So we've already been introduced to uh, numerous of these nuclei talking about the, um, the cranial nerves. So, of course, you've got the uh, accessory ocular motor uh, that we see on this slide, as well as a superior salivary, inferior salivary, and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. So these are the parasympathetic nuclei that control parasympathetic functions in the head, neck, thorax, and most of the abdomen to the uh, splenic flexure of the colon before the descending colon. So accessory oculomotor, also known as Edinger-Westfall nucleus, is located in the midbrain here. Uh, you can see uh, we have the oculomotor uh, nucleus here in the middle and the uh, accessory oculomotor uh, right next to it, closer to the periaqueductal gray. Now, when uh, I went through uh, as a student in graduate school, I had to uh, look at sections of all of these uh, brain stems and brains and telencephalon, prosencephalon, uh, and I had to identify all these different structures. I'm not asking you to do that, but I still find value in looking at these and understanding their relation to each other in the brainstem. So we see here the periaqueductal gray around the cerebral aqueduct. In the brainstem, we have here uh, the white matter tracts of the corticospinal, uh, the crus cerebri. We have substantia gelatinosa behind that, uh, along with here in the middle, these uh, slightly grayer portions the oculomotor nuclei, the accessory and the primary oculomotor nuclei. So if we move uh, farther down into the pons, now we'll see the superior salivary nucleus, named because it is more superior than the inferior salivary nucleus. Superior salivary nucleus uh, located here within the facial tract of the facial nerve, facial nucleus right behind it. We can see the crossing fibers of the pons uh, that form the middle uh, cerebellar peduncles there. Uh, so, of course, you know the functions of superior salivary uh, nerve uh, or nucleus, and now, so, knowing that we're lecturing on these again, understand that this material is fair game still, because this is important stuff about how the hypothalamus and the autonomics work. Now we're moving down into the, into, uh, the lower pons, uh, where it joins with the medulla, and we can see the inferior salivary nucleus here, uh, close to the um, uh, trigeminal uh, uh, sensory nucleus uh, and the dorsal motor nucleus. We can see some, well, you don't care, whatever, moving on. Uh, so now we see here the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus nerve nestled between uh, hypoglossal nerve and the nucleus tractus solitarius. This little dot here is the tractus solitarius, the white matter and then the uh, gray matter around it, which is lighter in this picture, that is the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. So, hence its name. Uh, so, I'll move on. Of course, um, we are familiar with these nuclei. Uh, now, uh, we, the sympathetic, so those were parasympathetic nuclei. Now, the sympathetic nuclei are the intermediolateral subcolumn in the thoracic spinal cord. In order for those thoracic spinal cord uh, neurons to uh, produce their sympathetic functions in the rest of the body, they have to travel up and down the sympathetic chain. So as I mentioned in the last video, these mostly synapse on the parasympathetic chain ganglions, or ganglia. And after doing that, they will travel up or down the chain to get into the head or get into the legs uh, to travel down the arms um, to whatever uh, resulting structure we're talking about. And to do so, they travel along arteries. So sympathetic GVEs love arteries. So remember the parasympathetic uh, GVEs in the head and neck, they loved GSAs. Well, the sympathetic GVEs love arteries. So these are going to travel along the arteries to get to whatever target uh, is the case. So here we have the uh, superior cervical ganglion 
sending its sympathetic fibers up the internal carotid artery along the carotid plexus. So it forms the carotid plexus. These sympathetic neurons form the carotid plexus, enter the cranium, and then travel out uh, along like the ophthalmic artery to uh, synapse on the pupillary dilator to uh, create, um, uh, to dilate the pupils, etc. Superior tarsal muscle. Uh, so that's why that Horner syndrome results in these conditions. So moving on uh, again, uh, so now we're talking about the afferents again of these systems and getting a different view. So here we see the nucleus tractus solitarius in the, uh, in the, uh, um, um, uh, the, below the, I just said this like two seconds ago, medulla, in the medulla. So that's how our brains work sometimes, I guess. Uh, so getting afferent information from uh, all of these GVAs, including, uh, so actually nucleus tractus solitarius gets SVAs and GVAs. The SVAs uh, isolate to the superior portion, GVAs to the inferior portion. And uh, that forms the central core of, as we learned last time, the autonomic systems. Um, uh, okay, so here we see <clears throat> we've got, we've received the GVAs in the uh, caudal uh, NTS. So those uh, GSAs have all synapsed in the caudal NTS. Now those neurons within the NTS, within that nucleus, send projections to various different locations. And to, in so doing, they regulate a number of different autonomic functions. These autonomic functions include uh, things like salivation and digestion, um, wakefulness and blood pressure, arousalness, activity levels, uh, as well as regulating some smooth muscles via the IML and the nucleus ambiguous. So uh, say, for instance, you have some um, noxious, you've eaten some noxious, bitter food uh, and you need to regurgitate, well, that sensory information, those GVAs are going up to the NTS. The NTS is sending out uh, a neuron to uh, nucleus ambiguous and down into the, the gut to regulate the smooth muscles of the gut to reverse their flow, nucleus ambiguous to, uh, to modulate the pharyngeal constrictor muscles uh, in order to expel that food back out as a regurgitation effect. So that's an example of that. Uh, these will also have collaterals that synapse on what are called central pattern generators. Central pattern generators regulate things like our breathing rate and our heart rate um, and, and things like that. Uh, so uh, in so doing, they can respond to internal changes like changes in blood pressure or oxygen carbon dioxide content via the carotid uh, body, carotid sinus to regulate our respiratory rate and to uh, bring us back into homeostasis. <clears throat> So here uh, we're talking about some of these, uh, these uh, outgoing processes from the NTS. These outgoing processes extend not just to the brainstem nuclei we were just talking about in the central pattern generators. Well, they do synapse in the periaqueductal gray, which then goes on to regulate central pattern generators. But we have collaterals that go to um, the parabrachial nucleus as well as fibers that go to the hypothalamus. So here we can regulate via the hypothalamus our endocrine functions, hormone release uh, in an immediate uh, kind of way. So say that we uh, eat some sweet food, uh, whether it's, uh, so our body doesn't know if a sweet food is high or low calorie, it just knows it's sweet. And so the uh, NTS is sending that, I'm eating something sweet, uh, uh, signal to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus says, great, let's store that energy as lipids in our body. And so the hypothalamus then uh, sends out uh, signals, hormones to the body that cause the body to store energy. 
uh, from eating uh, sweet foods, for instance. Parabrachial nucleus is going to regulate our emotional response to our GVA autom uh, autonomic sensory fibers. Uh, in so doing, it sends that information to the amygdala, and the amygdala is responsible for forming memories based on emotional experiences. So say you eat that lovely sweet brownie uh, with the, the, such nice dark chocolate, and it's melty and mm, it's yummy. Uh, well, so our parabrachial nucleus is sending that information to the amygdala. The amygdala says, oh, this is not a fearful situation. This is a good situation. So I'm not going to signal fear. Uh, we're going to signal, uh, we're going to let the, the other functions of the body signal um, that what is happening right now is good and should be remembered as this good thing. So the limbic functionality is saying, okay, remember how you got that brownie so that you can get it again and again because that brownie made me feel good. Uh, so part of that reward functionality as well with dopamine. But a parabrachial nucleus is also sending this information to the insular cortex. Insular cortex is responsible for sen internal sensing of your internal states and your emotional states, your internal well-being. And so this is how you get conscious information about how the internal, your, your body is doing in an internal and emotional sense. So that's where that information is consciously processed in the insular cortex. Uh, okay, uh, so, the, uh, so now we're talking, so this is happening with the SVAs as well. I just gave you an example, kind of a brownies and sweet stuff. It holds true, so uh, SVAs are doing that as well as GVAs. GVAs coming from the digestion of your stomach, SVAs coming from taste buds and things like that. So same concept, uh, slightly different uh, variations there. Um, so this, this red is showing you the SVAs and the superior NTS. Now, so that information that's getting to the hypothalamus, what does the hypothalamus do with it? Well, the hypothalamus has a number of different nuclei within it. Right now we're boiling that down to parasympathetic nuclei anteriorly and sympathetic nuclei posteriorly. So that information then is synthesized in, and weighed in the hypothalamus, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic functions descend the spinal cord, descend the brainstem. They give off collaterals to whatever visceromotor nuclei is important, like the brainstem uh, visceromotor uh, GVEs that we've talked about. Uh, and it extends down uh, into the thoracic uh, and sacral spinal cord via the dorsolateral longitudinal facet. Well, the hypothalamus spinal tract extends down the spinal cord, the dorsolateral uh, longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, dorsal lo uh, longitudinal fasciculus is doing these brainstem nuclei. So it's much shorter. Uh, so other things that these tracts synapse on are going to regulate our arousal and wakefulness directly. So not only is the hypothalamus regulating hormone release by the pituitary, but it's also regulating uh, more of these gain-setting nuclei and autonomic functions. Uh, so it will synapse on, it will go back down and regulate the uh, periaqueductal gray and the central pattern generators. It will uh, regulate the locus ceruleus which is responsible for releasing norepinephrine throughout the cortex and uh, other regions of the brain to, um, to change our wakefulness state. Uh, so we can pay attention to what's going on, uh, for instance. Uh, and then back down to the NTS to uh, you know, balance that input-output, make sure the input and the output are equivalent. Uh, so here we see in this drawing the location of those tracks, uh, not important, skip it. Um, and then the concept of these tracks in the spinal cord synapsing on the IML as well as the sacral parasympathetics. Uh, so take a quick look at that. Um, and then talking about Horner syndrome again real briefly to tie all this in together. So now we've got all of this information about how the autonomic system works, how it has afferents that get processed in the central nervous system and how those efferents then uh, have their effect on the body. So here, 
we, we have this clinical correlate. Uh, you can examine this uh, on your own time. But again, Horner's syndrome, superior uh, uh, cervical ganglion of the sympathetic chain, and then uh, you've got these, um, these uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms, which are very characteristic of it. So thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed.